as many people know, fighting substance abuse has really been a top priority for our office. And we've always tried to have a holistic approach, targeting the problem from a supply, a demand, and an educational perspective. We've also tried to look at all the root causes of this issue, and we've done extensive investigation to try to have permanent solutions that are gonna help our people. And we have to fix this problem because real people are dying, families are being shattered, our foster care system has been an absolute wreck, and so much of it could be laid at the feet of the opioid epidemic. We have to do more. I've made this a top priority in our office. And in fact, when I came in, we barely had any capacity with respect to opioid abuse and substance abuse fighting. We've changed that fundamentally. And so I'm glad you're here today because we have a couple of very important announcements. One, I've always said that culpability on this issue lies through all levels of the pharmaceutical supply channel. And I've noted the prescriber role, the dispenser role, wholesaler, and manufacturer. That's one of the reasons why we filed a lot of litigation against all aspects of the pharmaceutical supply channel. Well, today we announced two additional lawsuits against Rite Aid and Walgreens for their role in the crisis and failure to report suspicious orders. Now, we believe, and the complaint alleges, that these companies failed to monitor uh, for and halt suspicious orders to their pharmacies. And there have been a number of warnings that were out there in the past. So all of these companies should have been on notice. Now, we're going to make that available to you today. And this will now be a new phase of the litigation of our office. I think you're aware that we've had many pieces of litigation involving the wholesalers, manufacturers, and now we have the distribution side for the retail pharmacy. They're all important, and we're trying to get to as many as we can as fast as we can. You can expect more litigation in the upcoming weeks and months ahead. We're doing a lot of this work, this prep work, in-house, which is unheard of here in West Virginia. We've created this function inside the office because we want to get it right. Now, I mentioned the pharmaceutical supply channel, but government failure also played a major role in fueling the epidemic. Whether the policies involve trying to drive excess pain pill usage through reimbursement tools, some in the ACA and other laws, or setting up financial incentives for added prescriptions, we have to, as elected officials, look at what the government's doing, and we have an obligation to solve problems. And that's why today I'm proud to announce that we're releasing a comprehensive 52-page report about the Drug Enforcement Administration's utter failure to factor diversion into the national drug quota system. Now, we know that this is an issue that we've been focusing on for some time. I'm going to give you a couple of the key points. We're going to make this available on the website for you. You'll have a copy of the report. We have about 2,000 pages of document. This started back in 2015 when we sent a FOIA to the DEA asking them basic questions about how the national drug quota system was being run. And that FOIA started after we had read some of the GEA reports showing that there were problems with what DEA was doing. Now, the DEA is supposed to protect our citizens by controlling the production of dangerous drugs like prescription opioids. The agency is supposed to limit production of these drugs for what is necessary for the companies, for the country's legitimate medical and scientific needs. Unfortunately, as the opioid crisis raged and as pills were being diverted from legitimate medical uses to abuse on an unprecedented scale, the DEA was absolutely asleep at the switch and they allowed more and more and more pain pills to be produced. When one sees the massive increases in the number of pills that were allowed to be legally produced, you wonder how local, state, and federal officials even had a fighting chance to stem the growing tide of opioid prescriptions and subsequent deaths. Now, my office, a number of years ago, became deeply concerned that the agency was failing to live up to its mission. And that's why we launched this investigation into the DEA. 
And the documents that we're making public today, you'll have every document that we've had access to it, that they're gonna show that our suspicions were correct. Industry want and agency incompetence substitute for patients' actual medical needs. Utterly unacceptable on every part and every level for the American public. Our analysis goes through 2010 through 2016, and that's because we filed the FOIA in 2015, and then we filed additional FOIAs in 2017. Between the time period of 2010 and 2016, DEA was not even attempting to account for opioid diversion and abuse when it set production limits. What's worse, DEA abdicated its role of setting these limits, in many cases, to the drug makers' projections. They would look and see the drug makers' request and their need due to increased sales and wouldn't question whether those sales were part of a growing trend of abuse or legitimately needed for patients. Now, following the reforms that we won as a result of our lawsuit, I think people recall I sued the DEA the end of 2017, early 2018. Following that lawsuit, we started to get commitments from the leadership. And ultimately, major improvements have been made. We work with Attorney General Jeff Sessions and Attorney General Bill Barr, and they are working, Sessions did and Barr, they're working to get on the right course. I applaud Attorney General Barr for all of his efforts in this area, but I also know that much more work needs to be done to get it right, and American lives hang in the balance. Now, we had a couple significant findings from our analysis. One, that diversion of prescription drugs was a significant driver of the op overdose epidemic in America and in West Virginia. We also have learned that deaths from heroin lagged behind those from prescription opioids. Once again, prescription opioids were the gateway to taking many of these other products that have been driving a lot of the recent overdose deaths. We've also learned that roughly three quarters of the heroin users started with prescription opioids. That's pretty unbelievable. And the punchline, around 70% of the people who recently abused opioids, they obtained their drugs through diversion, not through prescriptions. Those are significant findings. And we wanted to provide this to West Virginians today and to make sure that as we're all working very hard to go after the root causes of this opioid epidemic, we have to make sure that the mistakes of the past are not repeated. Now, I've had many discussions with Attorney General Barr and others within the Trump administration about that, and I've been very pleased with uh, the collaborative approach that we've had. So thank goodness we've had that change in partnership. But there is a lot of work that needs to be done, and needs to be done making sure that government is not part of the problem causing drug overdose and death, senseless death. Now, the other issue that I wanted to mention today is that my office continues to work with the counties and the localities and folks across the nation to develop an abatement plan to make sure that we're going to have a comprehensive way of abating the problem here in West Virginia. And obviously that abatement plan is going to have a significant amount of influence in terms of how dollars are targeted here in the state. We continue to work with public health experts, with people in the state, and we're working to get this right. We have to make sure that monies are targeted to those who actually need help. And that means more money for substance abuse treatment, for education, for prevention, for law enforcement. It'll go across the board. I'm hopeful in the upcoming weeks and months ahead, we're gonna have some additional news with respect of some of the litigation we're involved in. We know that the Purdue case continues to move on. We'll probably have more to report about that in the upcoming weeks and months ahead. And we also know that there are some ongoing litigation that's out there. The big uh, MDL case has been scheduled, rescheduled for October. We've been working in a collaborative manner with the municipalities and the counties, and in fact submitted an amicus brief from the state of West Virginia to make sure that people knew that when we settled those cases a number of years ago, we specifically carved out the cities and the counties. And we did so to put West Virginia in a very strong position. West Virginia 
has been doing better than virtually all states in terms of some of these settlement dollars, that's going to continue. And we want to make sure that we're going to keep collaborating with all the relevant people to reflect the fact that West Virginia's bore a very heavy price for this terrible epidemic and it needs to get addressed. So I'm pleased to have the opportunity to provide this report to West Virginians and to the country today. And I'll look forward to answer any questions or about any other topics that may be on your mind. I'm appreciative. I think we're mostly uh, following through on the social distancing today. Sorry that our conference room's not as big as others, but I'm grateful that you all came and I'm happy to talk about anything drug related, uh, COVID-19. Uh, we're here to uh, be transparent for you. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. For question right here. Sure. Um, obviously, you've been at this for a little while. Your first boy, you said, was 2015. Yeah. I think your lawsuit was 2017. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about the process. Yeah. So it was like, the boy, so now it was like a six year case. Yeah, we, let, me, let me walk this through for you. We actually have a timeline, and we can make this um, available for you. I don't know that I have the timeline, but I, I know it off the top of my head. So we started the process, Stephen, in 2015, where we filed the original FOIA. We really did not get any substantive response back. Uh, we basically got blown off by the DEA through 2015, throughout 2016. With the new administration in 2017, we went right back at it and we filed a new FOIA. So at the beginning of 17, we still had no information back from the DEA. Sometime in 2017, I don't recall exactly what month, I met with Attorney General Jeff Sessions, and the Attorney General actually indicated he wanted to cooperate and provide a lot of the material we had asked for in the FOIAs. That process began. We had a lot of conversations leading up through 2017. They were good discussions, but quite frankly, not enough progress was being made in 2017. So we sued the DEA at the end of 2017 because we wanted to fix the problem and we wanted to get our documents. After we filed the lawsuit, we had discussions with the DEA and we talked about trying to push through significant reforms. And you saw the fruits of our labor back in 2018 with the announcements of the Attorney General's review and ultimately the rulemaking that reflected a lot of the arguments that we made that the diversion system was flawed. Then, after we were able to get the commitment, not only for the changes, we kept pushing and said, and we need our documents. So beginning in probably late 2018, 2019, I'm looking at Tom, Tom did a great job on this report, uh, we then started to get documents. So we've probably had the documents maybe a little over a year, year and a half, and we've gone through this. We were originally going to get this out a couple months ago, uh, but as you guys know, COVID-19 is, uh, been a little bit of a distraction. So, but I think it's a really good report. Uh, it's probably not some of the sexy stuff that you're used to seeing or reading or reporting on, but there's a lot of really good information. And I think it goes to the heart of what all public officials need to be focusing on, which what are the root causes and then how do we fix it? We wanted to take the time to do it right. You'll see, we put every document up on the web. I hope, Curtis, is it on the web right now? It's on the web, there are over 2,000 pages. So we went through every one of them and then we put together a, a pretty comprehensive report. So that's why it took the time that it did. And I appreciate you asking the question. Uh, we kept bird dogging this because we want to get it right. I always thought that this was one of the core drivers. There are a lot of problems. There were some of the early medical journals back in the day talking about pain pills starting in the 80s, going up through the 90s. There were the um, illicit marketing efforts by some of the companies. That goes into the 2000s. We talked about every aspect of the pharmaceutical supply channel. But this information is a little bit different because you're dealing with uh, one agency that arguably has a duty, more than almost any other in the country, to focus on going after substance abuse. And yet they knew there was a problem. And we have documents showing they knew there was a problem, yet they didn't take the steps that were needed or they didn't even work with the FDA appropriately. And the FDA knew it was a problem. And some of the FDA staff at the time reached out and said, hey, there's a problem. Yet numbers soared and people died as a result. Well, quick follow up too. Yeah, please. On that, um, how did your report jive with the uh, Inspector General or DOJ report that came out right at the end of uh, 2019? They did a pretty comprehensive report too. I imagine there's a lot 
sure. I think there's a lot of similarities. They point that out. What we did, though, is we built it based on a lot of the documents that we were given access to. And so we went through, a, I think, a pretty thorough review. But I don't take issue with any of the work they did. I think it was very uh, positive. So, But this is meant to really build in. And you're seeing, uh, I think, additional information about the quota system and what people knew at the time. Now, I want to note that we don't have access to all the documents that we want, but we did get a lot. And once again, I want to commend Attorney General Barr and his team. He's been very good to work with and help provide a lot of detailed information to us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, a couple things. I mentioned it a little earlier, and I think they're pretty significant. The diversion of prescription opioids was a significant driver of the opioid epidemic. And I think the last piece that I mentioned, I, I think is unbelievable statistic. We believe around 70% of the people that recently abused opioids obtained those drugs through diversion, not prescription. Think about that for a moment. So when you set a quota system and you set an amount, and if a significant amount of what's permissible to manufacture and distribute in our country is subject to diversion, and that's what's helping to allow people to get hooked on the products and ultimately then go to some of the other illicit products, that's one of the prime causes of this problem. And it has that information needs to get out more and more. Now, like many different issues, this is complicated, right? There are economic challenges. Uh, and some of the reasons why people have gone to prescription opioids. There are public health issues. There are so many aspects of it, some of the litigation that we filed. But I think that government's role in the problem has not often been adequately analyzed. And that's part of what we're trying to do today. And I'm not here to say that there's one sole entity that's responsible. But I think we need to drill down and focus on this because they were one of the prime movers. Well, there are a couple things. One, uh, you could have diversion when there is excess product that is lying around uh, grandma's medicine chest. And then people take that product and they might then resell it in order to make a profit. Uh, you could have situations where obviously people can buy things uh, on the streets. There are a lot of different ways if you introduce a massive quantity of excess supply into the system, then there are a lot of entrepreneurial people who are going to want to sell it. And obviously, there have been a lot of uh, criminal actions related to the pill mills and some of the doctors that were originally involved. A lot of that, it, there's been progress made in recent years. And a lot of good work, US Attorney's Office um, and folks within some of the state agencies and the federal agencies. Um, but I think it all starts with, how do you come up with a system to reflect medical need? And that's, what do people need for the legitimate pain needs in their country? So uh, we have some material that we can um, cite to. Tom, I don't know if you remember what page in the appendix we have that, but some of the specific aspects of diversion that were factored in. But we can make that available to you. That's on our internet site. It's a, the executive summary of the report breaks a lot of that down, too. Other about? questions? Yeah, yeah please. I mean, what, what was the biggest, what was the government's role in, you know, in the spot fire system? You know, when did they know that, you know, that was really a problem? Did it say in those documents when they started to, to realize the problem? Yeah, there, we think that at least one part of the agency knew uh, a long time ago. There were actually there were huge spikes in the numbers of uh, opioids that were allowed to be manufactured and distributed. 2013, I believe, was a very big year. And interestingly, one of the things we found through our review is that there was, I think, knowledge on some from some within the DEA that these tactical diversion squads could actually be very effective in going after diversion. And they would go before Congress and they would actually ask for funding in this area. So they knew that there was a real problem. And yet, then when you go to the actual quota system, you don't have that follow up. And in fact, you're not factoring diversion at all. And we saw that through the documents. We asked for every document which would try to reveal what they're doing to factoring diversion. And we couldn't identify any meaningful methodology. And 
I think that's absolutely incompetent and inappropriate. And once again, I want to commend Attorney General Barr and a lot of the folks we work with now who have begun to make a lot of these changes that are important. But we saw that basically one hand didn't know what the other was doing because DEA has a lot of enforcement roles. They set the quotas. They also are very involved. They have ARCOS. They have enforcement. Uh, but we saw that some of the budgeteers seem to know the importance of diversion, but those on the national drug quota side uh, obviously did not. Yeah, so we're trying to work closely with them. Uh, we're in lockstep in this litigation, and I think you're going to see some, some very good results. I think a lot of people uh, really don't appreciate that the AG's office has certain authorities, and we try to exercise them um, as appropriate. Uh, but, for instance, I don't think that we have the ability to settle a number of the cities and the county's claims, and I don't think that was within our authority. And I've said that. So, you know, people would say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? We have to act based on the authorities we have. What we have done is we've been working very closely with a number of the lead lawyers uh, within the MDL and the MLP uh, to try to have a consolidated approach. And uh, I think that that effort is going well. Once again, because of COVID-19, there have been some delays. Originally, there was going to be a trial. Uh, in August. I think that's been pushed to October, and that may go on through the end of the year. Uh, but we're doing our best to work with them. I think that amicus brief that we filed, I think that's a good sign of some of the things we're um, looking to do, because we're in a position to know what aspects of the case were settled to not. So we were able to provide that uh, to the court, and I think that's a really helpful piece of information, which is going to be a big boost to the uh, cities and the counties. What other questions do you guys have uh, on drugs, on COVID, on anything? You had mentioned there were some documents that you couldn't obtain at this time. Are you still working to try and get those, or are those just completely uh, out of hand? And are those documents that will further progress this, or are they saying that? I mean, we're issuing our report right now because we think we have enough a body of documents that we wanted to get out there. We'd always want more. Now, with any governmental body, there are going to be assertions of privilege or FOIA protection. And so, uh, you know, we have no plans to file a lawsuit related to those documents. I think the agency has tried to cooperate, and they've worked in good faith. I mean, I've talked to Attorney General Barr about this, and I think you've seen a, kind of a sea change in the approach. We couldn't even get much uh, feedback from folks back in 15 and 16. It was brutal, and yet we kept going at it. So it's been a much um, better approach. Look, it's not a perfect process. Part of it is that every federal government is going to have bureaucrats um, that are locked in, they're fixed in, and they don't want to have anyone scrutinize their work. Uh, I think people need to know that the public deserves to see the fruits of their work as much as possible. No COVID-19 questions. We're all... We're all done with that. Did I have anything? Yeah, no, no. Well, I'd mentioned that before. I I had indicated earlier that we had made public that we filed the lawsuits against Rite Aid and Walgreens. So we did that earlier. We have a copy of that available. Um, so I had mentioned that. So if you have questions about that, let us know. Very similar to. The yeah, they're they're focusing on the distribution side of the equation and uh, primarily the allegations relate to uh, the failure to submit suspicious orders and adequately monitor uh, and fulfill their duties under the laws. So uh, we're looking forward to continue to drive that case and we're gonna have more coming soon. Now, it takes a lot of time to put these cases together, to put this report together. I mean, this is real work and takes up a massive quantity of, uh, of our labor, but it's worth it. Guys, thank you very much. I appreciate it.